Hi, my name is Brandon and I'm an alcoholic and addict in recovery. Today we're going to start the section of Recovery 2.0 by Tommy Rosen where he demystifies the steps of the 12 steps. And the language that he uses, he, he has a general language that he uses so that they apply to any addiction. So depending on what program you're working, the language of the steps in his book might sound slightly different. But the ideas are exactly the same, no matter what addiction you're trying to apply these to. Step one is we admitted we were powerless over our addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. I'm going to read what he says about step one first and then discuss some of my experience with it. He says, in step one, we face two concepts, powerlessness and unmanageability. To admit that you were powerless over anything is probably not your first reflex, especially if it is your own behavior over which you came to be powerless. As mystifying as we might be to outsiders, addicts who do not have an understanding of the disease of addiction are equally dumbfounded by themselves. The powerlessness here is experienced by people who cannot stop themselves from taking their drug of choice and, once they have done so, cannot seem to stop wanting to take more. This is the phenomenon that most normal people cannot understand. And this is really important because I get a lot of questions about, well, why is it so hard for addicts to quit uh, doing whatever drug is causing this problem? You just quit. You just stop. And the stopping isn't the problem. Of course, you can just stop doing whatever you're doing. The problem is, is that then once you stop, you can't stop wanting more. And just using willpower to kind of hold those cravings and desires at bay, that only works for so long. You know, when I was quitting, and I used to be one of these people, I used to see people struggle with quitting smoking. Um, and I was a two pack a day smoker and I always said, well, when I quit, I'm just going to decide to quit and put it down and never turn back. And that's not what happened. Um, because I decided to quit and then 15 years later I was still smoking two packs a day. Um, and had at that point tried to quit like 20 times unsuccessfully. And the problem wasn't putting the cigarettes down. It was then the thoughts that came back and said, no, I, I want more. And dealing with those. Sometimes I could successfully deal with those for a long period of time. Other times I might quit two or three times within a single day. Because the thoughts that came with wanting the drug that I had put down were so strong that I could only hold them off for so long before I caved. And he describes that in this paragraph. The powerlessness therefore extends to an addict's thoughts, not just actions. The person stuck in addiction is overpowered by the thinking that would lead them to drink, drug, or an addictive behavior. Once that thinking begins, it is very difficult to prevent the thought from becoming manifest in reality. The addict thinks the thought and then takes the action to make the thought real. In this dark way, addicts are ex exceptionally creative people. They may be set against a behavior, but eventually the thought will wear them down and they arrive at the two words that per permit the action. Fuck it. It's a wonderful thing to admit the places where we are powerlessness, powerless in our lives. We gain strength from this kind of humility. When it comes to action, it is literally a lifesaver to be able to look in the mirror and say to ourselves, this thing has me licked. It is bigger than me and I will need help if I am to move beyond it. So that's what eventually happened to me. Um, in my addiction, I had successfully quit smoking cigarettes. I was done with those. I had actually stopped drinking. I was, you know, three years I had been, I had stopped drinking um, after being a very, very aggressive uh, alcoholic drinker. And, but I was still smoking a lot of pot. And uh, to the point where I was always high. If I wasn't high, I was very, very uncomfortable, irritable, and discontent. 
Um, and so when I finally broke down and said to myself, I can't do this anymore. I'm depressed. I'm scared all the time. I'm nervous all the time. I don't know how to deal with life. When I finally broke down um, I, and, and admitted, I can't, I need help. It was a wonderful thing. It was like a burden had been lifted from me. And then the question was, okay, well, what do I do now? You know, I, I, I have admitted that I can't beat this on my own, which I, I always thought I could. I always thought I could beat my addiction on my own. I always thought that I'd be okay if I could just have pot, you know, Um, I'd be okay if I just kept the alcohol and cigarettes out of my life and admitting that I was powerlessness even over that, it was, it was tough. And so because I was powerless, I also had this extreme unmanageability in my life. And that's what led to the depression and the darkness that really got me to a point where I said, I give up, I need help. Um, And he describes uh, the unmanageability like this. He says, the unmanageability, of course, is born out of powerlessness. Anyone who has experienced acute addiction can relate to the feeling that life has piled up in such a way that it feels like there is no way through at all. There is stress, there is never enough time, and it feels like you cannot take a deep breath. The details are varied among us, but the result is the same. Addicts often feel as if life is crushing them. And I was right there. And when I finally came to the point where I was willing to reach out for help, that's what drove me there. So it, it, he goes on to say that admitting one's powerlessness is hard enough on the ego, but it also hits on a deep sense of fear that most people hold, the fear of change. And that's what I didn't want. I didn't want to change, you know, and I was really worried that by not having any kind of drugs in my life, I wasn't going to be able to enjoy life at all. Um, I wanted to find a way to moderate, to be able to do a little bit and, uh, but still keep the, keep the good parts of sobriety, but also be able to use drugs. some. um, and he puts it, you know, that's part of the addict mind. That's part of our strange way of thinking. And the way he puts it is, How strange that you would like to find a way to continue something that has been so painful. And that's that's addiction, summed up right there. Um, And part of the reason that we don't like change, he sums up in that it's better to live in the hell you don't than to explore the realms that you do. Uh, He says, many of us would prefer to live in misery we can count on than move into unknown possibility. You just have to let go of trying to keep things the way they were. That's the trick. Venture into the unknown and you will find that what you had feared for so long was just an illusion keeping you stuck. And that's what happened to me is I gave up my desire to keep things the same. I was at such a bottom that I said, you know what, I don't want to keep things the same. I want things to change. I need to move forward. I don't know how. Everything I've been doing the last 20 years to move forward has not gotten me where I wanted to be, so I got to listen to someone else. And so I started to, uh, so I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to have faith in something besides myself. Um, I'm going to have faith in the people who I see at and at that moment it was at a residential treatment facility i'm going to have faith that these people know what they're talking about that they have my best interests at heart and that if i listen to them and do what they say i can find the same kind of happiness and contentment that it seems like they have because when i got into this residential treatment center the people who were working there a lot of them, if not most of them, were recovering addicts of some shape or variety. And yet they seemed incredibly happy and they had fun at work and they laughed and they enjoyed what they did and they talked with a lot of enthusiasm about life and how awesome it was. And I thought, well, that's kind of what I've always wanted and what I thought I could get with drugs and alcohol 
Maybe I should listen to these folks. And that's what Tommy says in the last paragraph about step one. He says, the first step requires tremendous faith. You have been stuck in really bad thinking that's been killing you slowly. Do not listen to your thoughts any longer. Rather, with humility and willingness as your guides, allow others to help you onto the shores of safety where your healing begin. And so that is where I had to, where I had to take a step back and say, you know what? I need to, for the first time in probably my adult life, become willing to listen to someone else, take a dose of humility that I don't know all of the answers and and look outside of myself for those answers. Once I became willing to do that, the journey started in earnest and the rewards started happening pretty quick. And that was really cool. And that made it easy for me at that point to take the first step and truly admit that with alcohol, with drugs, my life is unmanageable and I am powerless over those things. I am powerless when they are in my life. And so I have got to do everything I can in my power to keep them out of my life. And what I was told was if I wanted to do that, then I needed to, and I truly believed everything in the first step, that I needed to do steps 2 through 12. And that that was a lifelong thing, not something I just did once. And so I listened to the people who told me that, and that's what I'm continuing to do today. And I am fully confident that's what's continuing to keep me sober. So over the next few days, I'll go over what Tommy has to say about the rest of the steps, talk about my experience with them, and what they've done to help me keep sober. In the meantime, have a good day, and I'll be back tomorrow with step two.